Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We begin today's study in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. So if you are able, get your Bible, open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, we are going through the New Testament this series, which is something that I have never done. I have been going through the entire Bible for 33 years here on Scripture Verse by Verse and been through three complete times, almost four, and those are all archived for you at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at the thebibleversebyverse.com, and I would really encourage you, if you have not already, to begin an amazing journey going verse by verse, studying the Word of God verse by verse, an in-depth verse by verse Bible study at the thebibleversebyverse.com, and all you have to do is click and listen. Again, study the whole counsel of God, all 66 books, at the thebibleversebyverse.com using my audio Bible messages. Okay, I hope you're all set in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's pray and get into the Word. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 3, verse 1 says this, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. We talked about last time how God has said that a man must not be taught by a woman in church, nor is it allowed that a woman have authority over a man in a church. Therefore, a woman cannot be a pastor. No, God has never called any woman to pastor a church. If she thinks that she has been called by God, she is deceived because that is contrary to the word of God and the word of God is the final guide for us. It is the final standard for everything. And here we see an allusion to that very same thing this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Has to be a man. The bishop or the pastor has a serious responsibility. His job is to guard the people under him, spiritually speaking. He is accountable to God to warn about false doctrine, to warn about sin, and also to teach what is correct. That is by far the most important thing that a pastor is called to do. It is a high calling, and the stakes are high also because there are serious consequences if he doesn't do his job correctly, if he withholds truth because he wants to be popular, if he changes the Word of God in any way in order to appear to be an intellectual and thus misrepresents God and His Word, that will have a negative domino effect on the people that he talks to. And he will be held responsible for any damage done to any immortal soul as a result. So, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Verse 2. A bishop, then, must be blameless. He must be blameless. That means above reproach, blameless. He can be accused, but no one better be able to prove that that accusation is correct. 
His conduct must be good so that if he is examined, he will come through clean. He represents Almighty God and the pure word of God. So it says, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Notice, it does not say the wife of one husband. It says the husband of one wife. Again, the pastor must be a man. And if he is married, he should only have one wife, not several, like some men had back in those days. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate. Temperate means to be sober-minded. In other words, he must be in control of himself. He must be watchful, ever diligent. He cannot go overboard on things or let his feelings carry him away to the point where he does not judge right and wrong correctly. He must be sober-minded, serious-minded. Notice that? A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded. He has to be of a sound mind. He has to think clearly and speak and act not just clearly, but cautiously. He cannot be reckless or allow his emotions to dictate his decisions or his words. Like it or not, people hang on every word that a pastor or a preacher or a Bible teacher says. And so he has to be sober-minded, a sound mind. Think before you talk. I was. This was brought home to me you know, I was, I was the young, I am the youngest of, of six children. And uh, my, my oldest brother is 18 years older than me. Uh, my next closest uh, sibling is four years older than me. So I came along late in life, as far as my mom and dad were concerned. And it's interesting that I grew up, I grew up, and I'm not complaining, it's just the way it is. I grew up and, you know, I was Mikey, always Mikey. I think my dad called me Mikey until the day that he died. And other people called me Mikey. I don't care. That's all right. But it does illustrate the fact that I was always Mikey. And I can remember whenever Mikey would say something, even as a teenager, I don't know, maybe I was just really stupid and, and foolish in the things that I said. That could be. But oftentimes I would say something that I think was pretty profound, <laughs> you know. And there would be no response. Nobody listened to Mikey. Nobody paid attention to me. I grew up thinking, okay, what I say doesn't matter, okay. That's just kind of the way it was in my mind. Huh? Well, you know, what I say doesn't matter. Then I came to Christ at age 25. And then I started preaching and teaching the Bible. Uh, at age maybe 28, 27 for the first time. And all of a sudden, I started uh, preaching in churches and taking over, you know, uh, teaching classes and Wednesday night service or whatever. And this is, you know, I'm in my early 30s or mid-30s perhaps. And I remember distinctly having some fellowship with the church after I got done teaching. Everybody was sitting around the table, and a lot of these people were younger than me. And I said something, and they just stared at me, listening intently to what I said. And I thought to myself, that's strange. I never had that happen to me. And then it dawned on me. I, I'm not Mikey anymore, not to these people. I'm I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. They're looking to me. They are hanging on every word that I say. I wasn't used to that. But it was true. From that moment on, I started praying every day, Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut. Help me not, this is what I prayed. 
Lord, help me to keep my mouth shut. Help me not to say anything about anything that does not need to be said. Help me only to say the things that you want me to say. And if you don't want me to say anything, then don't let me say anything. Help me to measure my words carefully. That was, that was a sobering thing for me. And that's how a pastor, a preacher, a Bible teacher needs to be. Sober-minded. A sound mind. Think before you speak. So, he goes on with more qualifications of a pastor. A pastor or a bishop must, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, of good behavior. Means to have orderliness in your life. Another word for sober-minded, orderliness, correctness in thinking. Good behavior refers to orderliness and correctness in behavior. Sober-minded refers to orderliness and correctness in thinking. Good behavior refers to orderliness and correctness in behavior. They go hand in hand. One builds off the other. You ought to be able to count on a pastor. You ought to be able to count on a Bible teacher. His behavior needs to be consistently reliable. He says what he means. He means what he says. So a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, given to hospitality. Hospitality literally means helpful of a stranger. He must try to make strangers feel welcome. You can't say God loves you and cares about you and then turn around and be cold and indifferent toward people that you are teaching or that you want to teach. It just doesn't fit. You've canceled your words by your actions, if that's how you are. And then there's one more thing in verse 2, one more for qualification here in verse 2. Given the hospitality and apt to teach. And you know that the only qualification for a pastor that is not tied to character is that he must have the gift of teaching. He must be dedicated to prayer and the study of God's word and therefore able to teach the truth. And pastors better know that something is true before they teach it as truth. Or if they find out later that what they've been teaching is wrong, then they better admit it. Because again, there are so, you, I mean, no one's perfect, but when you realize that you've made a mistake in what you've taught, swallow your pride, take your lumps, and admit it, no matter what it might cost you. There are some people who think that a pastor in his teaching is omniscient, that he knows everything. It's just not true. We are constantly learning. I'm constantly learning. And if I have taught something that I don't believe is in the Bible in the past, I always correct it. Very important. Teach the truth if you believe it's true. And if you believe later that you are wrong, then you need to humble yourself enough to admit it. And some people might be disappointed. Oh boy. You know, I, I was taught the pre-tribulation rapture. I, that's what I was taught in Bible college. That's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what I was taught by the men, the teachers who discipled me. I mean, that, that's what I was taught. Um, I had some reservations after about 15 years. I started seeing that it just didn't add up. But that's what I taught. And so for like the first 20 years that I pastored or taught, that's what I taught, the pre-tribulation rapture. I had a church full of people that believed in the pre-tribulation rapture very vehemently. I just kept studying the Word of God. And I thought, that's not true. There's no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. It doesn't line up with Scripture. These people who teach it have to copy and paste scriptures and fill in the blank. And so when I came along to teaching whatever it is, 1 Thessalonians, and I had to teach it, 
I taught a different view, the view that I now hold. And I knew it was going to be bad. I didn't think it would be quite as bad as what it was. But I lost 75% of my income, 75% of my congregation. Because they were of the mindset that if you didn't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, and they've been taught this by others, never me, you just don't believe the Bible. You're a liberal. Believe me, I'm not a liberal. And I believe every word of the Bible. But I taught it. I knew it was going to be bad. And I did. I lost. I lost. I knew I was going to lose some. I knew I was going to lose probably a lot. I didn't think I'd lose 75%, but it wouldn't have mattered. I still taught it because I had to. I got to stand before God and give an account. So you have to be apt to teach. You got to teach the truth, no matter what it might cost you. Verse 3, Not he continues, not given to wine. A leader, a spiritual leader cannot drink too much wine, too much beer, too much of anything. He may think he can handle it, but even if his thinking is impaired just a little bit, that little bit is too much because a pastor has to be sober-minded and sober. He has to be sharp, spiritually speaking, at all times. And too much alcohol will affect that and make him dull. And you just can't afford to do that. So, a pastor must not be given to wine, not violent. You can't pick a fight if you're a pastor. You know, you can't punch a false teacher in the mouth. Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy of filthy lucre. This would disqualify a whole lot of preachers, so-called, on television today and elsewhere. Greedy of filthy lucre refers to being focused on obtaining riches and also the desire to be popular or to have the applause of people. That is filthy lucre. That is a deadly attitude for a pastor or Bible teacher to have. If you are greedy of filthy lucre, you're going to make all sorts of concessions to error. You're going to leave out truth you may not teach blatantly false doctrine, but you leave out truth that offends because you are greedy of filthy lucre. You want a bigger church. You want more people coming. You don't want to ostracize anybody. So you just keep teaching and you just make the, you just make the messages and the sermons as, as, uh, as plain and as mundane and as vague as you possibly can. And don't tell me that doesn't happen. It's happening all across this country to get a bigger offering or a bigger crowd because you are guilty of filthy lucre. You shouldn't give a man like that two cents for an offering. He's not worth, he's not worth two cents. He has sold out Christ and he's disqualified from being a pastor, a preacher, a Bible teacher. Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. A pastor has to be patient. The spiritual leader has to be patient, meaning he must be willing to give up his legitimate biblical rights, if need be, instead of quarreling to keep them. He must patiently bear bad things that are said about him, and if he preaches the word of God, bad things are going to be said about him. Goes with the territory. And when he does defend himself or God's word, he has to do it in a decent way. He has to be like Christ and repent and confess as soon as he fails to be like Christ. What's another qualification for a pastor? Look at verse 3. Not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. Not a brawler. Brawler means he cannot quarrel. Or get in a fist fight. We kind of touched on this earlier. Cannot quarrel or get in a fist fight. When dealing with unreasonable people, you give them the truth, and then if they don't want it, and it's obviously the obvious that they just want to argue and debate something, 
you walk away. You don't sit there and quarrel. I don't quarrel with people. I'll spend all the time that I need to spend with somebody who's hungry and just confused or unsure. I'll be patient with them. I'll patiently teach them the word of God. I will. I'll try to answer every one of their questions. Absolutely. But when somebody understands the truth, they just don't like it and they want to debate me because they love some sin and that's why they hate the truth or because whatever. I know people who don't believe in eternal hellfire. They don't. They believe in annihilationism. That ungodly people who reject Christ go to hell and are burnt up immediately. That's not taught in the Bible. That is nowhere taught in the Bible. But I know a lot of people who believe that. And they want to argue with me. I don't argue with them. I give them the truth. I'm not going to sit there and argue with them. I clam up. I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue. The word of God is the word of God. Last part of verse 3. Not a brawler. Not covetous. Boy, it's a big one. This goes pretty close, hand in hand, pretty close with uh, greedy of filthy lucre. Not covetous. A man of God, a preacher, a pastor, a Bible teacher cannot be covetous. Means he cannot love money or the things of this world. The things that money can buy, money or the things of this world. He can't love that kind of stuff. Now, it's okay to enjoy things. And the things that money can buy. That's okay. But not love them. And what this basically involves is being more concerned about the things of Christ, eternal things, than the things that, mon that, that many in this world live to have. You got to be satisfied with Jesus. Because if you're not satisfied with Jesus, you are guilty of the sin of covetousness. I know people who are pastors. I've talked to them. They're so blind to their sin that they are openly covetousness over a bigger house or a bigger car or more money or more things that, the, that money can buy that they actually complain about it. They shouldn't even be in the pulpit. They shouldn't be teaching, preaching. They shouldn't be a pastor. They are a horrible example to the people that they are supposed to lead. They are disqualified. He continues, what else? Well, verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. If he has children, then he must be a good father. And that means good the way God defines good. He has to rule his family well. He has to teach his children how God wants them to behave. And like God, he must punish willful rebellion. I don't care what, I don't care what society says. I don't care what the standards of the 21st century America are when it comes to raising your children. If you're a dad and your children are willfully rebelling, you must punish them. No, that doesn't mean abuse them. But, but a spanking doesn't abuse anybody. I don't care what anybody says. God says, if you beat them with a rod, they will not die. And those who do not discipline their children hate them. That's what God says. You got to rule your family well. That means love them. And when you do discipline them, discipline them in love by all means. But you got to discipline them. And a preacher who doesn't do that is raising a brood of monsters. And he is disqualified. He must, like God, be good to his children, love his children, enjoy his children, and encourage them too. God does all those things. See, you don't need a how-to book to be a good parent. You just need to stay close to God and learn from Him, and it will come natural. Yeah, throw that how-to book in the garbage too. Nah, 
Use it to start the fire as kindling in your fireplace, if you have one. Verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Yeah, it is less complicated to lead a family than it is most churches. Consequently, if a man cannot control and manage his family with using the scriptures as a guide, there is no way that he can possibly be qualified to lead a ministry. If it is chaos at home, it will be chaos in church. If he's not disciplined enough to train his children at home, he won't be disciplined enough to study and pray and lead the people God sends his way either. He's disqualified. Again, every one of these qualifications for being a pastor or a minister for that matter <clears throat> have to do with character. Except for that one, he has to be able to teach because that's the most important thing that he does. Six, what else? Not a novice? Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. I don't care how smart a man is or how successful he has been in business or how eloquent he may be. If he is a recent convert to Christ, he should not be given a leadership role in the church. A man has to be grounded in the word of God. He has to be mature spiritually or he isn't qualified to be a pastor. Spiritual leadership is a whole different ball game from any other type of leadership in the world. So you, you might be a good leader at, at work. You might be a good, a good baseball coach. You might be whatever. But you're not qualified to be a leader in the church if you're not mature and you're not grounded in the Word of God. Seven. Moreover, he must have a good report of them who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. And there it is again. He has to be a man of good character. Living for Jesus and speaking the pure word of God will rub some people the wrong way. Those people will look for opportunities to discredit the man of God. That's why he has to be a decent, law-abiding citizen who pays his bill and treats pays his bills and treats people with respect. He cannot give the enemies of Jesus any ammunition to use against him. If they're going to say something bad about him, they better be lies. Eight, in like manner, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. You know, in the book of Acts, the deacons were assigned to assist the pastors. And because they are in positions of leadership, they represent Christ in a visible way, which is why they must be of high moral character as well. Those who represent Jesus must live like Jesus or they misrepresent him. See, every Christian is a representative of Jesus, but those in leadership are more visible. And so the stakes are higher for them. They can do more harm or more good depending on their character. Verse 9, holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. If you're going to represent Jesus, then you have to have a good grasp on what is true and what is false. And what Jesus says is good and what Jesus says is bad. Or it will be impossible to represent him correctly. You got to be grounded in the word. All spiritual, spiritual leaders have to be firm in their belief in Christ and have a good grasp of God's word. If that's not there, then all they can offer those who look to them as sentimental words or a pep talk based on nothing, and you're likely to lead people astray if you don't know the truth yourself. Great qualifications, wouldn't you say? We need to measure our spiritual leaders by the word of God, and if they don't measure up, then... We shouldn't look to them. We shouldn't support them. Okay, out of time. Continue studying the Word of God with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Not underwritten by a large church or denomination, never have been. So if you want to be a part of this ministry, pray for me, pray for God's Word. Also, when you take a break, click the donate button at the top of the front page at the thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I will see you next time right here on Scripture Verse by Verse.